I can't seem to let this consumption issue drop. I've been working on the PWM85 hardware, which I did try and show in a live stream, but the demo didn't really work. I've built the PWM85 solar charge controller on a breadboard. Now remember, this is an 80 tiny adaptation of Julian Eilert's pick-based PWM5 solar charge controller, which is uh, sat just here. Julian managed to make his solar charge controller very efficient at just one milliamp consumed when the LED isn't flashing. Let's just prove that. So with my meter in line with the PWM5 solar charge control, let's turn the power on and it uses about 10 milliamps while the LED is flashing. And then look at that, 0.75 milliamps. That's really impressive. Whereas the AT Tiny version that I put together pulls about, well, 2.6 milliamps more than twice as much but it's an awful lot less than my early build versions when i created this pcb i was resigned to the fact that 2.6 milliamps was as low as i could go however thanks to some great comments on the last video on this subject i've been able to reduce the consumption some more Numerous people suggested putting the AT Tiny into sleep. Trouble is, I want the PWM cycle to quickly respond to changes in the solar input and the battery level, so I don't wish to delay that change if I can help it. In addition, pulling it out of sleep mode is difficult. I've no real spare pins, and the AT Tiny doesn't have a connection to the solar voltage, which could help identify day from night. A guy called Mark commented suggesting a few different tweaks where I could turn off functions of the chip using registers, crucially the power reduction register. Unfortunately I'm using timer 0 and timer 1 and the analog to digital converter so that only leaves one other thing to turn off, the universal serial interface and unfortunately that only saves about 0.1 milliamps at 5 volts and actually I haven't managed to get that working successfully. But Peter kindly commented to point out that reducing the voltage supplied to the AT Tiny can reduce its current draw. I'd originally discarded this option because of the charge pump which Julian implemented in the original hardware design. The charge pump generates that higher voltage using a couple of digital pins, a couple of capacitors and three diodes. The digital pins oscillate in antiphase, raising the capacitor voltage on its high side. When this digital output goes high, the voltage here goes up by about 5 volts. This is then dumped through the diode to the next stage of the charge pump. And of course, going through that diode will drop about 0.6 volts. The next digital pin goes high, and once again we've added about 5 volts here, and then that's dumped through the diode once more. So by adding 5 volts here and taking away 0.6, we're roughly adding 4.4 volts at each stage of the charge pump. But of course reducing the voltage to the AT Tiny reduces the effectiveness of my charge pump. And then I went back to the Wikipedia article about charge pumps and I remembered this image which shows that one digital pin can be connected to multiple stages of a charge pump. So in a way this is like a basic camshaft isn't it? The odd numbers here are high at one point and the even numbers will be low and vice versa. And you can create multiple stages. It did make me wonder actually how many stages you can go through. How high a voltage can you create? So I built up the 3.3 volt version of the solar charge controller on the breadboard using an LP2950 3.3 volts and uh, we can see now on the output of the charge pump which now uses four capacitors and five diodes we've got 20.7 volts and that should be enough to make sure that this MOSFET turns on really fast and really hard uh, to ensure it doesn't get too warm. Now I know I could look at a MOSFET driver or a dedicated charge pump IC which could give a similar solution but it wouldn't be true to Julian's original design in my view. This design also allows me to use the same components which are already in the bill of materials. And here in the shed, the one thing I had to buy was a 3.3 volt regulator, of course. 
Even though I've changed the supply voltage to the AT Tiny, I've not had to change the resistors here on the voltage divider used to measure the battery. The set point for that flow voltage is calculated in the code when it is compiled. So as long as you change the code to ensure that you're using the 3.3 volt version or the 5 volt version, well, the measurement should just work. With the breadboard design working, I designed a new revision of the PCB and luckily for me, I had it manufactured before the Chinese New Year. Tonight, I want to put this together and check it all works. Well, actually, because I've panelised these boards, I'm going to build two. So there we have all the surface mount components in place. Let's drag the oven out. But before I get the oven out, let's just have a quick look at these graphs because I've done a bit of tweaking with the oven this week. Uh, the Rocket Scream sketch does output every second the temperature that it's meant to be uh, set at and the temperature it's actually achieving. And therefore you can drop that quickly into uh, Google Sheets here. And uh, here's the graph and as you can see, it's okay as a as a sort of profile for leaded solder. Uh, the soak stage, however, isn't very flat, is it? It's kind of just about getting there and then carrying up. That ramp speed isn't brilliant. But I made a slight change to it this week. And uh, I think the graph is looking a lot better. Uh, it's difficult to show here on the iPad, but this is a steeper curve here than uh, previously so it's ramping up the temperature much quicker and uh, we're seeing it flattening off a little bit in the soak before the flow uh, section up the top and uh, crucially we can see well this one was taking about 440 seconds I think it's now taking about 370 seconds to uh, go through the whole process from uh, warming up to cooling down and being cool so uh, definitely that's an improvement isn't it we've knocked what a good 50 seconds off the whole um, period there which has got to be good for the components hasn't it but what have I done well all I've done is line the thing in tin foil and actually only the bottom back and top if we can see that yeah just about so yeah the top back and bottom have been lined in just one layer of ordinary aluminium foil oh and of course the front as well but i've left a little window uh, this yellow tape is captain tape it's high temperature tape and do you know what it's made a huge difference to this oven uh, there were quite a few gaps i noticed especially at the bottom where there is a crumb tray uh, but of course you know heat rises but even if your coolest hot air is escaping out of the bottom you're losing some heat so yeah just a layer of tin foil in this oven and it's performing an awful lot better. That's looking quite good. Just waiting for it to cool down. I have to say I'm pretty pleased with the result and uh, yeah, this is definitely the first time I've put anything as big as this IRF 3205 in the oven and uh, even that the tab seems to have soldered quite nicely perhaps you can see that a little bit better on this one than this one uh, the only thing is that both leds on both boards have slightly shifted perhaps there's an issue with that footprint but hopefully uh, these work because of course this is also the most sensitive components i've put in my oven since building it that's certainly the AT tiny 85 i don't want that to be uh, damaged hopefully these are good boards right so i've hand soldered the terminal block and the isp headers 
and I've programmed the AT Tiny, so I know that that survived the oven. I've not bothered with the Transorb because we don't need that for this test. On the left hand side I've got my Vicky meter uh, and it's in current mode and we're going to find out how much uh, current the PWM85 3.3 volt version takes. Now it's uh, on a circuit board so let's plug that in. Yeah so it's it's consuming 1.58 milliamps well that's one milliamp less than the five volt version so i'm really pleased with that one milliamp i know doesn't sound very much but well that's one milliamp power every hour so that's 24 milliamp hours a day saved that's 8760 milliamp hours saved every year i think that number's right but that's 8.7 amp hours well that's more than this lead acid battery in the background so i think that's a really good saving okay so i need to check that this actually does charge a battery and regulates correctly so i have that lead acid battery there still in the background it's powering the pwm 85 and it's sat at 12.98 volts it's not long come off charge but actually for this experiment that's quite useful so on the input, I'm going to connect up an old transformer from the mains, which acts a bit like a solar panel. Uh, that's because, well, it's dark and I've got no chance of any solar coming in now. So I'm going to attach that now. And the voltage on that battery starts going up past 3.2 volts and climbing. That seems to be working reasonably well. We're charging that lead acid battery in the background up to 3.4 volts now and hopefully somewhere close to 3.5 volts the PWM85 should start regulating. We'll know that it's regulating because I've made a slight improvement to the code and when it starts regulating there we go it's just starting to do it now. The LED starts to flash so it's showing that it's uh, at float voltage and it also gives a rough indication um, on how the, the PWM cycle actually on the MOSFET. So um, the brighter the LED, uh, the less that the solar panel is connected to the battery. Um, now obviously this is regulating ever so slightly low, 13.46 volts. Um, I can calibrate the value of the uh, regulator within the AT Tiny and I can get that to be absolutely spot on if I like. But yeah, the LED is now flashing to say we're in float mode and this PWM85 is successfully regulating the voltage on the lead acid battery. Excellent! So there we are then, I've been able to shave one milliamp from the PWM85 solar charge controller by changing the regulator adding a couple of capacitors and a couple of diodes. I've also managed to put two quite complicated boards through my homemade toaster reflow oven with a 100% success rate. Hopefully you've enjoyed this video, if you did give me a thumbs up, subscribe down below, comment if you can and I will see you next time. Thanks for watching.